Welcome to the Innovation Meets Leadership Podcast. Real inspiration for real innovators. If you're looking for innovation and leadership transformation, your journey starts now. Welcome to the Innovation Meets Leadership Podcast. I'm your host, Natalie Bourne. I would love if you would help us spread the word by leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. And of course, head over to our YouTube channel and hit subscribe now. Well, today we are talking to Alex Castro. Alex is uh, not only an aligner of execution, which we all need, and it's that place where strategy, right, meets digital transformation and innovation. So I'm excited to talk to him today. He's a best-selling author. He's also the creator and founder of Rem Art of Remscore, which we're going to talk about today as well. I'm super excited. Welcome to the podcast, Alex. Thank you so much, Natalie. It's really a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm excited to have the conversation. Well, you have this um, this phrase that that you say, which is you believe that um, there's a huge gap, right, between ideas or strategy and execution, and it kind of creates this um, persistent problem where it sidelines too many high potential digital transformation and innovation growth opportunities. I want to dig right into that, and I would also love to understand how your REM score impacts that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that um, we regularly see as a company, you know, we've been doing management and strategy consulting for 20 years and, you know, globally. And one of the things that we regularly uh, saw as an issue is that um, there really was this massive amount of investment and attention to uh, qualifying an idea. Uh, but then when it came to actually rolling it out and getting it done, it was almost as if it was just tossed over a wall and given to a team of people and said, all right, go get this done. And more often than not, that, that team of people just kind of would look at, you know, would look at their leadership and be like, I'm not really clear um, how we're going to get this done. And when you begin to dig into it, right, it, you come down to some a, a very fundamental set of understandings, which is... It comes down to, to three numbers that I'd like to throw out um, that, you know, has been uh, out there for a long time. It's 20, 30, 50. So 20% of strategic initiatives make it through. 30% of strategic initiatives deliver about 60% of the intended value. And half of strategic initiatives are either abandoned or fail outright. And what we've seen over the years is that companies can't really find that pace of acceleration and transformation uh, you know, because a lot of their great potential is watershedding away in the execution process. And that's what we really want to help the industry with is, is you know, what we say as a company is that you know, your potential is our purpose. And so we really want to see companies see their potential. Wow. That those numbers are staggering as you as you read those off 20, 30, 50. I had to write that down and then of course say, you know, I've been a part of those organizations and have felt the weight of exactly what you're saying. Um it's it's thrown over the fence and then executed poorly and then um oftentimes those execution teams are held accountable versus the entire organization for, you know, just the lack of way that that idea was brought to life. So, talk a little bit about um about your product and how that is kind of shaping and changing um, how we think about some of these things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, to kind of give some context to it, um, if if the listener, if you're a sports fan, you know, there's this there's this um, perception um, in business that says, look, we're going to create this optimal execution model, and we're just going to repeat that model over and over again. Um, by that same level of reasoning, the, the team that won the Super Bowl last year, the World Series, uh, the NBA championship, the Stanley Cup, um, they should be able to repeat that model every year, right? They should be able to come out on top every single year. And there's a reason they don't, right? Uh, and that's because the landscape changes every game and the landscape changes every season. And the misperception really within uh, leaders in, in companies 
is that they've built an organization that can adapt to any situation and deliver on those ideas at any given time. And that uh, really comes out of what's called cognitive bias. And those cognitive biases are what influence our decision making. And behavioral economists for the last 25 years have been shouting uh, at the top of their lungs that human beings are absolutely terrible decision makers and that we continue to have these fallacies that we can actually get it through. And the reality is that most organizations have done everything they can to tune their execution model to that point where they're really so close to that, having that repeatability. And like, uh, you know, what, I, what I've been using uh, lately, and, and I hope the listener doesn't get uh, start rolling their eyes on this one, is um, it's, like, it's like when R2-D2 sticks his hand into the side of the Millennium Falcon and just turns that little knob, and then suddenly the Millennium Falcon just goes, they're trying to figure out frantically how to get the thing to go to light speed. And all he did was turn that little knob, and all of a sudden they're gone and everybody's in, in great shape. And, and what REM score is, is that little knob. It's that thing that's been shut off to decision makers for, you know, uh, forever, um, simply because the, the, the dots hadn't been connected, the tech wasn't there, um, and all we did was connect a bunch of dots between behavioral economists, be, you know, um, industry research uh, that in essence began to identify what were the root cause reasons why strategic initiatives were struggling to come to life. And we built a mechanism that um, in essence harvests that information real time, like every coach does in terms of analyzing the team they're about to play every time, right, before they go into the game, um, builds a game plan to be able to address that, uh, REM does the same thing. It tells you where the blind spots are. It tells you where those little picadillos are that are going to leap out at you. Um, and, you, you know, for the technologists, you know, listening to this, it's not you, <laughs> right? If you're doing some kind of technology centric effort today, which in essence is virtually every strategic initiative, um, it's not the technology, it's not the technologist, it's not the project management office, it's not the, the architecture or any of those techie things. It's the fact that you have uh, a playing field that is different conditions with different players every single game, and you have to adapt. You have to understand what that landscape looks like. And so what we do is we harvest that information real time using um, machine, you know, models based on machine learning, uh, based on swarm intelligence. We gather that sentiment through an indirect uh, virtual interview, and we collect that data in about, and synthesize it and provide you an output in about two to five days versus the three months it usually takes to do that from a consulting basis. And so now you're investing those dollars that you would use in the consulting analysis into the consulting correction. So now you're getting that alignment. So you were about to ask a question. I'm sorry. So are you looking, are you looking kind of historically at the organization and how effective they've been in the past, or are you just looking current at the, at the decision? No, real time. It's, it's like game time, right? It's, you know, it's, it's, if you look at, again, you know, I, I kind of put it in the, into the sports metaphor because it, it really helps for uh, a lot, most people to connect to it, right? Which is the fact that uh, just because you were able to do it last year or you were able to do it the last game doesn't mean it's going to work this game. And the, the context here is that what's deeply, I think, uh, leaned on, but tends to be the thing that really misguides us in our decision practice in this, in this sort of cognitive bias, is that past performance can dictate future outcome. And it's just not true. Everything is situational. And especially at the velocity of business today, in terms of the, the nimbleness of clients, how industries are shaping and changing, how conditions are changing, um, it has to be assessed within the context of that strategic effort. And then uh, what are the different conditions? Because every strategic effort has different players involved in wow. the process. 
That's powerful. I mean, I think if I think if we can help our organizations prevent this um, unnecessary failure, I mean, I think that a lot of times um, when when an initiative does fail, oftentimes um, I don't feel like organizations can point back to the pieces of why it failed and ensure that they create a different outcome next time. That's right. Um, you know, I mean, again, the 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 context and the information and, and the data that we're using um, that we create that we used to create our uh, product and the capability to measure this has come from 25 years of of studies by super smart people, right? That are far uh, more invested in each nuance in, in what happens. And we connected the dots. And, and really what the industry data is showing is that today about $280 billion a year is lost in opportunity and potential um, in efforts that are abandoned um, and are not uh, you know, pushed out the door. And so imagine if you curb that by 10%, by 15%, you know, or you do a 5% change per year. Um, not only will the company growth and the potential of companies really begin to realize itself, more importantly, what does that do for employees? Like, you're, you know, when you were mentioning before, you've been on the receiving end of those projects where you're like, okay, got to figure this thing out. In today's world, right, um, and, you know, I think most people can, can relate to this, is that uh, employees are a lot less patient in, in suffering failure. You know, uh, it's not just investors. It's not just your board. It's not just your leadership. The employees themselves are like, look, I want to be part of a winning entity here. And if you're continuously handing me stuff that I can't get done, I'm going to go find a place where I can start to connect to purpose better. And so it's not it's not only a, uh, a function of growing the business and, and transforming the markets that you're driving towards. It's also about retaining employees and creating this this. Um, this cohort of, of people who are winning together. And, and that's why, um, you know, that that's why we have the title of the book, you know, measure, execute, win to, you know, be able to really emphasize that. This is amazing because I think, you know, you, you brought in another layer, which I think is something that, um, we don't talk about enough and that's the impact, um, that employees feel when they're a part consecutively of a fail of a failed initiative, right? Over and over again, when there's multiple um, back to back and you have to, you have to think about it. Like you said, like a sports team, um, typically morale begins to drop, right? If you lose game after game after game. That's right. That's right. And there are, there are some professional teams that cannot get out of this uh, down cycle. Right. And um, they always get the top draft picks and, you know, cause they consistently, you know, are, are not winning every year and that doesn't help them. Right. And so you can go out and recruit incredible talent, but that's not going to change the course on its own. Right. Um, even, you know, I remember when, you know, I'm dating myself a little bit, but I remember when Jordan was drafted. Right. And he came in and he was like a machine. I mean, that guy was Jordan and, but he had no supporting cast and, you know, he was scoring a, a million points a, a game and, but the rest of his team couldn't, couldn't keep up. And so the, you know, at the end of the day, really what it's about is from a transformation standpoint, it's just that missing piece of insight. It's understanding how ready are you? Where are the blind spots? Can I correct those in the time against the window of opportunity that's available? And if you can do that, your potential is starting to really rise and you can really meet that acceleration and time to market that you're looking for. How do organizations use your tool to then apply this forward? Not only on the initiative they're trying to look at, but then what are the ways that they as an organization begin to hopefully learn a little bit from this? Absolutely. Great question. Um, what we really like to talk to is that, you know, you can run a REM score and understand how to really execute in an optimal way for a project or maybe two or three projects. But let's say you begin to leverage this within the context of your portfolio and your, your strategic decision making. Um, once you begin to gather that, REM score really turns into a data collection tool, not only about execution capability for each project, but also the institution as a whole. How capable are you to pivot 
to a different strategy? How much can your operational model adapt to the next iteration of the business? And that's vital information for leaderships to be able to make decisions. And um, that's the thing that we really want to be able to roll out over the next couple of years is really having that insight so leaders can really understand how adaptive is their business to strategy shift, how often can it do it, and what are the consequences of that? Because, um, you know, it's, you know, we're in an age where you know, your current state is not what's going to deliver your future state 100% of the time. That's I'm so excited to hear you talk about kind of the the capabilities piece of it. I think that oftentimes when um, a lot of organizations enter into strategy, they don't spend enough time talking about, like you mentioned earlier, execution, but also capabilities, which tell us how well we'll be able to execute or not. And so um, I think that's a big component that I'd love to spend another second or two on on just capabilities and how they impact you know, execution and success of an initiative. Yeah. So in our, what we found is that there's about 14 domains of influence that affect execution, right? Um, Again, two of them are technical. The rest of them center around uh, the alignment of the business to the idea, you know, culturally, market-wise, and uh, strategically. Um, We also deal with the capacity of the business units to Uh, deliver that value? How good is the leadership? Can the organization adapt to the change? Is the vision clear? Um, What's the, um, you know, what's the, the, the overall um, way that you govern change? How do you uh, then um, focus on uh, developing the priority uh, and the uh, criticality of change and so on and so on. And so, it's, it's a lot of those nuanced issues that undermine execution. Uh, because again, most companies, their project management teams, their product management teams, their acquisition integration teams uh, are really well-tuned, very capable people. Um, what they're lacking really is that understanding of where are we off in some of these areas? Um, And suddenly that one project turns into 10 or one major project with nine micro projects trying to fix the rest of the business while you're trying to build that core product or integrate that core or critical acquisition. Um, And so, you know, it's, um, you know, again, acquisition, you know, it's, it's, it's a 50, 50 proposition, half of acquisitions detract value from the acquirer and half are either neutral or add value to, to the acquirer. Um, there's a lot of potential loss, but there's also a lot of risk involved in the sense that, you know, are you really investing the right dollars in the right direction, um, around what needs to happen? So, wow. Well, when I just heard you rattle off all those things, which I tried to capture as many of them as I could, you know, it made me realize how important um, the work that you guys have done is and how I hope that people will um, avail themselves to some of the resources that you have available because um, this to me, the focus on this becomes just as important as the actual initiative itself. And so this is the the upfront work that I think people have a hard time putting in. And so, um, you know, I, something that I'm trying to introduce into, you know, organizations is the idea that sometimes you do have to slow down in order to speed up. And, you know, when you don't have that approach of slowing down to get the lay of the land, that's where all the the mistakes are made. And that's where all the um, opportunities are missed because we are not orienting ourselves with the lay of the land before we jump in. And, you know, then the fight starts, right. To try to figure out how to, to reshape this as you're in the middle of, of it all. That's absolutely right. I mean, you know, I think that uh, uh, the military's had this right for a long time in the sense that sometimes you have to go slow to go fast. Yeah. And, you know, the thing that we run in terms of res- into in terms of resistance is um, people feel this um, urgency to m- just get going because they're afraid that the window of opportunity will leave them. 
And, you know, a lot of us have been trained. It's like, we'll just deal with it as it comes. You know, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. You know, we'll, we'll do. And, and in today's world, and it's been this way for, for over 10 years, but really in today's world, um, if you get to that bridge and it's not ready to support you in, in crossing, there's no recovery. Like you're done. That's it. And there's no retrenching. There's no second shot. The window of opportunity is gone. A competitor has come in and done it. Um, somebody else is, 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 uh, on top of it. And, you know, that's just, uh, that's just a shame because I, you know, there, again, the innovation engine within companies is so alive and thriving today. And so many people have been really dialed in to innovation as part of their daily job, where 15, 20 years ago, it was like, hey, can you think about maybe looking at it differently? Now everybody looks at it differently. And that is opportunity. It's potential. And again, it's, you know, how do you tune that in? And so Again, back to the to the sports element, um, you know, there's a hair's difference between the top team in a league and the bottom team, and it's really how well can they put the execution component together, right? You can have the best playbook in the world, um, but if you don't know how to really tune that play in and you know block and tackle the right way, um, it, you know, it's it's kind of useless. So. You know, foundationally, it's there um, and it can be done. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about um, rigged decision making? <laughs> well, yeah. So rigged decision making um, comes a little bit also from a, again, a misunderstanding between uh, sort of strategic success and failure versus execution stress and failure. Uh, it's success and failure. And so what happens is that it gets confused a lot of the time, right? So one example is like when Dell tried to put kiosks or put kiosks into Walmart, uh, it didn't really work out for them, you know? And they said, well, there was an execution problem. It's like, well, there was really no execution problem with that. You know, the, the, their supply chain worked beautifully. Their salespeople worked beautifully. The strategy just didn't fit because you're not going to go to Walmart to go to a Dell kiosk to buy a high-end desktop computer. It's just, it's just not the, the right place. Um, the, micro, the Microsoft Zune, by many people's standards, was better than the Apple iPod, right? That was a strategic failure. Not an, the product worked beautifully. There are, I mean, I've run into people who still have a Zune. <laughs> they still listen to it, right? Um, it's not an execution problem. That's a strategy problem. And so the thing that, that we see is that there is this, you know, again, it goes to a cognitive bias, you know, we're, we're inherently bad decision makers because we want things to be a certain way. And so we ignore the signs that it's not going to work and we push towards the outcome that we want and we, you know, we um, get ourselves into a position that's not recoverable. And so, you know, largely I think that really what we look to do with REM score is design a mechanism that in essence works like the credit score for strategic decision making, right? It's, you have the business plan, you have the financials, right? And it's the same way bankers used to make decisions for a loan in the, in the fifties and sixties. That's the way corporate America makes decisions today because they don't have the credit score that says, can I actually get my money back? And that's the thing we're introducing. Again, it's that little, metric, just that one number, a couple of numbers, a little bit of detail that says, look, if you did these few things, you could actually be in a much better position. Your, your uh, score is going to come up a little bit more and you're going to, now you're going to be in the, in the sweet zone of execution and you're going to, you're going to get some, some good traction here. It's amazing. Um, what final thoughts would you have for our listeners today? Um, you know, the one thing that I would offer is that um, a lot of the content that we used is out there. So, if you want to go and read about this, it's, you know, it, almost every month there's some kind of article around this in Harvard Business Review or MIT uh, Review. Um, there's uh, articles continuously and books continuously coming out on this topic. And, you know, pay attention to it, learn from it, um, absorb it a little bit. I mean, you, you don't have to be an expert in it. It's more to the effect that the data's always been there. 
and we've chosen to ignore it because for some reason we're gonna we're gonna get past it. And um, you've got great teams that are that are producing innovation, producing opportunity, potential for the business. Figure out what's the little tuning that you need to do on a continuous basis, like any good coach does on their team, and be able to understand what's my blind spot. How do I fix that? And you know, in a, in a, before I get into game mode, because once you're in the game, you can't fix it. And uh, and get you know, and, and simply just get more out of it. And in doing that, you'll begin to see more growth. You'll be, begin to see more uh, connection to purpose and, and, and movement in, in the vision of your business. So it's all right there. It's all really available. And it's, and it's not a, it's, it, it does, you know, the one thing I'd like to close with is that um, people who do use REM see up to um, delivering projects twice as fast um, at about a, a two thirds the cost. And so there is, you know, again, it's doing a little slow to go a lot faster. Um, you know, the acceleration is there, the lower cost is there, and the success rate is definitely higher. Awesome. Well, this has been amazing. Alex, how can people find you or follow you? Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, so Alex Castro, I'm out there. And uh, with M Corp is the name of the company. Um, you can go to www.the-mcorp.com. Uh, you can also look up Remscore uh, online. And uh, we're not hard to find. So it's... Uh, it's all, it's all pretty straightforward. Well, awesome. Thank you so much. This has been such an amazing conversation today. It's been completely my pleasure. And thank you so much for including me as part of your platform and um, uh, all the best. Absolutely. Well, to our listeners, thank you for joining the Innovation Meets Leadership podcast. Remember, don't just get out of the box, break the box and set it on fire. Let's go transform something. Thank you for joining us for the Innovation Meets Leadership podcast. Be sure to subscribe to our show on iTunes. Follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Innovation Meets Leadership. And visit our site at innovationmeetsleadership.com for more innovation resources.